think you've really got me in the mood for some animal discussions because you are in a, look like you're in a very regal setting. Like you need a fireplace going with, you know, <laughs> a taxidermied bird on your shoulder or something. You can't tell, but right there in that corner, what looks like a mount for a TV is really just a rhino head that I can yep. swivel around. <laughs> 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 Speaking of animals, favorite animals? You guys Ooh, got one? That's a good question. It's hard to pick a favorite because there are so many good ones, but I'm a big fan of possums. I know people are think they're kind of gross, but they play dead. They don't get Lyme disease. They are pest control in the form of eating ticks. They have prehensile tails. They're the only North American marsupial as far as I know. So I'm down oh, with that. Yeah, I, I love that you had five reasons for loving possums just <laughs> Right on the top yeah. of your noggin. Yeah. I mean, do I mean, you not? <laughs> I mean, I guess it would have taken me a little longer to get to those reasons. I would have had to do some Googling. Yeah, I don't naturally keep track of what animals get Lyme disease, but now I feel like I should. It's useful information to have, especially in this sure. post-pandemic world. Yeah, that's true. How about you? You have a favorite, Kyle? I do. I do. I love penguins. I was actually in the library that I worked at today. We had penguin bookmarks and a kid grabbed one and just started yelling, pinguino, 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 <laughs> as he ran out of the library. <laughs> I was like, I want to be that kid someday. Amazing. It's a good <laughs> aspiration. Just listen, just to get mine in real quick for consistency. Yeah, throw it in there. Red pandas. We can move on. Okay. Oh, they're adorable. I like it. I, did you watch the uh, the Pixar movie? No, I didn't get around to it. I gotta. Maybe for our next movie night, that's what we'll watch. Yeah, all three of us will watch <laughs> all three of the us Pixar together, movie together. Our next movie yeah. night. I'll be yeah. there. I'll fly out from California. We'll do it in person. We'll cuddle up next to Kyle's rhino head with some <laughs> popcorn and some buttered parsnips. <laughs> some oh, buttered beautiful. parsnips. I love it. Speaking of which... Welcome to Butter No Parsnips. Every week on Butter No Parsnips, your hosts Kyle Imperator and Emily Moyers take you on an adventure through the weird, wacky, wonderful, and sometimes even wicked world of one wayside word. Strange characters, delightful bits, and general joyousness abound. Join them as they test each other's etymological expertise. Hey everybody, welcome to Butter No Parsnips. I'm Kyle Imperator. And I'm Emily Moyers. And Kyle, I've got a great word for you today. I'm just going to dive right in. Oh, oh okay. Yeah, you yeah. you are going to love, love this word. It's a good All one. Right. I mean, yeah, lay it on me. Your word today, Kyle, is tautonym. Ooh, tautonym. Uh, can you spell that? Yeah, it's T-A-U-T-O-N-Y-M. Tautonym. 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 Hmm. Okay, well, I'm going to counter your word. Uh, bold and unheard of. <laughs> I know. I like to be different. Well, my word is Michael Steffen. You mean the page runner for at Tottenham's on Instagram? That's right. You got it. Hey, there we go. I'm, I <laughs> always do really good when your word is a person. <laughs> yeah, it's good. You know, pronouns. <laughs> hey, Mike. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you for having me. Yeah. So, Mike, I guess Kyle has brought you in here to help him guess the word. But before yeah. that, could you tell us a little bit about yourself? Of course. First, thanks, Kyle and Emily, for having me on the podcast. And thanks also to Seth Glixman for finding me and bringing me into the loop here. As you said, my name is Mike Steffen. I'm a lawyer in Southern California. When I'm not being a lawyer and debating the meaning of words and contracts and such, I enjoy learning about words and wordplay and the history of words. And although I am not a professional etymologist, or for that matter, a professional zoologist or any other relevant kind of ist, I am a person whose hobbies include identifying totonyms and researching their etymologies, which I then share on the totonyms Instagram page. And Lovely. we love that. And I think that's why I've brought you on as a lifeline here, Mike. I think you're going to help me. So totonym... What does it mean? And remember, this is life or death. So no pressure. But yes. I could. this could be the end for me. Truly. And if I can't get this right, it'll be the end for me too. Um, <laughs> yeah. Because this is my sort of main existence now outside of my job, I think. <laughs> a tautonym is a scientific name of a living thing, such as an animal, in which both parts of that scientific name 
have identical spelling. For example, the scientific name of the red fox is Vulpes vulpes. It is a member of the vulpes genus, and its specific name is also vulpes, making its scientific name Vulpes vulpes a tautonym. Hey, that's exactly right. Congratulations. <laughs> <laughs> you got it, Mike. You get to live. <laughs> I might still die, so it's okay. It's good. <laughs> uh, thank you for that, Mike. So you run at Tautonyms on Instagram, which is essentially a running archive of tautonomous species. What kind of work goes into something like that? I would say there's sort of two things I do to make it, to make it work or to put together the information that I put out there. The first is identifying the different tautonomously named species that are out in the world. There's no set list of what tautonyms exist. There are incomplete lists, which are useful. But once you sort of go through all of those, you have to hunt on your own for the tautonomously named species that exist. So that's the first part of it. The second part of it is taking those names and researching the etymologies of those scientific words. In some instances, that research can be fairly straightforward and somewhat easy, particularly for mammals, most birds, reptiles. These are animals that are well understood, were classified long ago, and are of popular interest. So the etymologies are somewhat readily available. For other animals like skippers, which are similar to butterflies and moths, or many mollusks and parasitic worms, There's not as much information out there for someone like me. So I'll do some deep dives into scientific naming conventions and other languages and try to pull something together. And in some instances, the origin of the name is just lost to history. So I'll put together maybe a creative analysis on what the name could mean or sort of throw my hands up and say, you know, the whims of whatever zoologist named this (laughs) are sort of how this came to be. And we don't really know. There's only so far you can guess with that. I, I like the idea of maybe like blaming it on the the researcher and saying it's it's their fault it's this way, not... Well, it's funny you should say that because a little bit of history here, one of the first groups of zoologists that came together to come up with naming conventions for animals came together in, I think, 1841 or 1842, and they wrote one of the first nomenclatural codes for zoology or a set of rules and recommendations for how to name animals. And they have a section on what they call nonsense names. These are names which they <laughs> believe Wild. would be formed from anagrams. Or I think in their words, they were coined at random without any derivation or meaning at all. And they recommended not to use these names. And this was in 1842. And what they said, I have a quote here. What they said is very like <laughs> apt to my life right now. They say sure. these nonsense names are are peculiarly annoying to the etymologist, who after seeking in vain (laughs) through the vast storehouses of human language for the parentage of such words, discovers at last that he has been pursuing an ignis fatuus, or a a fool's errand. That's so funny. (laughs) Because it's so accurate. Yeah. (laughs) So so they knew long ago that there would be some guy trying to piece this all together yeah. and he's having trouble. And that's me. They were like, you guys, this is going to be a nightmare for Mike. We got to stop <laughs> for Mike. Yeah. <laughs> Are there any existent nonsense species that you could use as an example there? Oh, sure. I mean, there's several. One that comes to mind is the name Extra Extra. This is the name of a small thing. It's called a minute sea snail in the Western Indian Ocean. It was named by malacologist or a, a mollusk studier named Felix Pierre Jusemi. I apologize to the Jusemis if I've pronounced that incorrectly. <laughs> uh, but he named it Extra Extra. It's not clear why he named it that way. And at the time, his contemporary malacologists were quite upset with him for doing it. They thought it had no relationship to the animal itself. They didn't didn't fully understand it. They thought it was like a joke, and it probably was, but that's still the name of the animal to this day. The joke is the power that they have over the naming process. <laughs> Mike, where did your interest in tautonyms come from? Well, I like wildlife. I like words. I like history. And the Tottenham's project began really as a pandemic project. I was actually telling someone a, a, one of my favorite lawyer jokes, which I'm happy to recite for you. If you're I mean, interested. I mean, now that you brought it up, we have to hear <laughs> yeah, it. Yeah, you've opened the store. <laughs> I can't just tease you with it and then you know back away slowly. So no, the no, joke no. is, what's the what's the difference between a dead skunk in the middle of the road and a dead lawyer in the middle of the road? I mean, this feels like a punchline that we can't say. <laughs> <laughs> there are skid marks in front of the skunk. 
<laughs> so it got me thinking, you know, maybe That's good. I would be That's happier good. if I had studied skunks instead of law. And I don't know, I just went on to Wikipedia and, you know, three hours later, I know a lot about skunks and a lot about totonyms. So that's sort of where it started. And I decided to privately collect these totonyms and do some research just for my own interest. And eventually I put them on uh, Instagram and now I have some little community that is interested in it. And that community includes etymology people as well as zoologists and, you know, people who like history. Yeah. So Mike, getting into totonyms a little bit, why, why do we have these? How do totonyms happen? Why do, why do these exist? So totonyms, they can come about in a few different ways. I'll say at the outset that they're really not that common in the grand scheme of animals that are out there. There's an estimated 8.7 million species of living things on Earth. There's an estimated 7.7 of those are animals. And of that 7.7 estimated animal species, one to one and a half million have been described by scientists and given scientific names. Of those, I estimate that there's fewer than a thousand, closer to really six or 700 that have tautonomous names. So it's a pretty small subset in the grand scheme of things as far as we know. And these names can come about in two ways. You can have a name just be a tautonomous name from the first time the animal is described, as in the case of extra extra. Or if an animal is reclassified, it can get a new name, and that new name might be tautonomous. I think I mentioned the red fox earlier. Really, the father of modern taxonomy, his name's Carl Linnaeus, he first classified the fox as Canis vulpes, thinking it was more like a wolf or a domestic dog. But over time, people decided it was dissimilar enough from them to get its own genus, so they named it the vulpes genus. And now you have vulpes vulpes. Do totonyms like assist in scientific identification? You know, it's a good question. I don't think totonyms specifically as totonyms really do much in that way. They're sort of an arbitrary quirk of often history. Scientific mm-hmm. names are very helpful in that way generally, which of course includes totonyms. But scientific names act as unique identifiers of the species, almost like a SKU code or something along those lines that allows zoologists to know exactly the type of animal that you're talking about when you're you know, referring to a red bird. Instead of that, you'd say cardinalis, cardinalis, the northern cardinal, or cardinalis, 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 a subspecies huh. of the northern cardinal. So it's really as unique identifiers, although back in the day, back when these you know, folks in uh, 1842 were writing about me, one of the reasons <laughs> that they had scientific names was also to describe the animal. They would want it to have a name that was in some way germane to the morphology of the animal or its habitat or its behavior. So cardinal is a reference to the red robes worn by Roman Catholic cardinals at the time. Oh, that makes so much sense. (laughs) Wow. Yeah. So that was the way uh, for many years. And there are many great names like that. And I would say, I don't know about the majority, but quite a few names are descriptive as well. Uh, My favorite is probably Nasua Nasua, which is the name of the South American Coati, a very like interesting, silly looking animal that has a long nose. Nasua being, right, the Latin word for nose. Like nasal. Right, right. So that's sort of what the names used to be, as well as unique identifiers. But at some point, customs changed and zoologists said, you know, there's just too many animals to keep track of. We're using the same word. Like a lot of animals (laughs) got a nose. A lot of birds are red. We need to spice it up. (laughs) So now you can you can form yeah. names arbitrarily. You can name it after your ex-wife or your dog or whatever, you know, and that happens. <laughs> sure. I love that. So as we understand it, Mike, I mean, you've given us some lovely examples already, but you've brought a few more examples of totonomous species. I'm hoping live animals that you have in your house right now. <laughs> I brought them to the studio. I'm going to Perfect. release okay. them all at once. <laughs> and... Uh, <laughs> Yeah, I've got some animals to some animal names to share with you in sort of a quiz format. The names get progressively more difficult, in my opinion, to unravel. And you know, I'm a fan of the. I'm a yeah. I'm a fan of the show, (laughs) and I I like the way you guys give a word and then try to figure out its meaning. We're going to do things sort of in the opposite direction today. All right. I'm going to give you the meaning or the etymological backstory and see if you can use that information to figure out what the animal is. 
Oh, love this. Awesome. So I let's call this game You Can Say That Again. You can say that again. Spell D W E. Okay, Mike. So go ahead. What's our first question? Okay. This mystery animal's scientific name comes from the Latin word for poisonous gas, which in turn comes from the name of the Samnite goddess who personified the poisonous, foul-smelling gases emitted from swamps and volcanoes. Okay. Okay. So it's something that smells bad. I'm feeling like it's got to be like some lizard or snake. What's that word? You're thinking of... For um, like the bad smell you get around volcanoes. Sulfur? Yeah. Rotten eggs? Is it the rotten egg lizard? (laughs) (laughs) Sulfurous, sulfurous? Oh, wait. Or is it just a skunk? Oh, or is it just a skunk? (laughs) We have a winner! We have a winner! (laughs) It was a skunk. Awesome. Yes, it is... It is the striped skunk. The very good. The scientific name is Mephitis Mephitis, uh, from which oh. you also get the word Mephitic, meaning a poisonous gas or foul-smelling odor. That Tottenham's guy came over and it was Mephitic in the house. Um, <laughs> so that that's it. And that was the first Tottenham that I discovered, and the one that sent me down the rabbit hole of other many other Tottenhams. I Lovely. I can see why. I can see why. Round two. I'm ready. I'm ready. I'm, I'm going to get this. Okay. One. This mystery animal's scientific name comes from the Latin word meaning I bind together or I compress in reference to its hunting style. It has been re- boa constrictor. Sorry, I jumped the gun. <laughs> it has been. You got to buzz been, in, Emily. It, <laughs> it has been reclassified and renamed numerous times over the years. And it is now one of the few species whose scientific name is the same as its common name. And that is the boa constrictor. Sorry, I got excited. Yeah. (laughs) I really wanted to make sure I buzzed in before Kyle. (laughs) Excellent answer. And it comes from the word constrigo, meaning I constrict in reference to its hunting style. Love that. So it's, it's... Constrictor, constrictor. It was it was constrictor, constrictor for a time. It actually started as boa constrictor, then it was reclassified and became constrictor, constrictor, and then it got moved back to boa constrictor. So it has gone on this sort of journey, as many animal names have. But at one point, it was constrictor, constrictor, making it a former tautonym and uh, a tautonym no longer. Well, that's a fun. It one. sounds like it's next going to be boa, boa, and then and then go back. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So round three gets it gets a little more difficult, but you guys are doing okay. great. I'm very impressed. Right. This mystery animal's scientific name has been influenced by Arabic, Greek, and possibly Somali. The modern English form of this animal's name developed around the year 1600 from a French word. The original meaning of the words that make up its scientific name may be translated into Arabic, excuse me, from Arabic into English. English as fast walker. Uh, is it like an, oh, there's so many animals that walk fast. <laughs> <laughs> like a cheetah is my first thought. That's a pretty good guess. I was going to say like ostrich, but then I was thinking maybe that's not in the right area. <laughs> well, but also, yeah, because if it's Arabic and Somali, I don't know if those languages are spoken where cheetahs are, but that's my formal guess. I can offer a clue. <laughs> If that would help. Yes, please. I please. didn't know we were getting lifelines. That's great. <laughs> There's a, there, we'll give you lifelines now that we're in this sort of medium level of difficulty. Zoologists okay, sure. debate whether this mystery animal is its own species or a subspecies of another species. If the mystery animal is considered a subspecies, then its scientific name could be translated into English as fast walker camel leopard, referring to its appearance. A camel leopard? <laughs> what kind of is it like species splicing animal is this? Like a like a a gazelle or something similar, like some sort of spotted uh, antelope type thing. Oh. It's not a bad guess, but I think you'll kick yourself when I tell you what it is. We're missing something so obvious, aren't we? Imagine a camel and a leopard loved each other very much. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. <laughs> so I'm imagine a cat with humps and and cloven feet 
Um, is that am I getting the right body parts you, here? <laughs> you, you, I love that image. It's sort of the opposite of the animal I'm thinking of. Oh, okay, but, okay. But that would be. I think we might have to resign on this. One. Yeah. Well, I'll I'll say this: a common name for this animal is camelopard. A camelopard is a synonym for a giraffe. Oh, oh my god. They walk we forgot fast? giraffes exist. <laughs> yeah, we forgot they exist entirely. Well, they just got such long legs. How could they not They're walk kind fast? of scarier than whatever a camel and a leopard put together might look like. <laughs> <laughs> yes, the words uh, camel and leopard refer to its long neck and its spotted appearance. Sure. sure. Leopard, in turn, is a combination of the words leo for lion and pardus, which was a word for a male panther. So the uh, oh. name of the northern giraffe, or arguably the southern giraffe, is Giraffa camelopardalis, which could arguably be translated as fast walker, camel, lion, boy panther. <laughs> Amazing. Uh, incredible. They were just like, put them all together. That's, you, just... you know what I'm talking about. <laughs> yeah, that's how I refer to them. It's a little wordy, but it's more interesting, I think. It gets yeah. the point across yeah, really it's, well. It, it's a better image in the mind. <laughs> And the southern giraffe is the one that is arguably a tautonomous species of giraffa giraffa. Love it. That's wow. I had I would never have guessed that that giraffes were (laughs) tautonomous. All right. Well, I don't have high hopes for our progress so far, but let's uh, (laughs) we're tied. That's good. Let's try. You guys are doing great. Uh, You're really doing great. And this one's a little tougher. But I think if you're a history buff, maybe you'll have an edge here. This mystery animal's scientific name comes from the Latin word meaning hindrance or delay. The name refers to an ancient belief that this small animal had the power to slow or stop creatures and other forces much larger than itself. Pliny the Elder attributes Mark Antony's pivotal loss at the Battle of Actium to this animal, stating that a fish of this kind stopped the Praetorian ship of Antonius in its course at the moment that he was hastening from ship to ship to exhort his men. Hence it was that the fleet of Caesar gained the advantage at the onset. History is insane. (laughs) Someone really sat down and said, it was the fish that did it. And I'm going to write a whole thing about it. (laughs) So it is, it's a fish. It's a small fish. It's a small fish whose name comes from the Latin word meaning hindrance or delay. And this fish is apparently responsible for stopping ships of Mark Antony in the Battle of Actium, Mm. changing the course of humanity forever. And I'm going to go out on a limb. I'm going to go out on a limb and say that Pliny probably wasn't the most accurate in his telling of this story. (laughs) <laughs> I think he was there. I, he saw the fish. I believed every word. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so right now, Kyle, I'm just running through all the fish species that I know, uh-huh. um, which basically means I'm running through the uh, aquarium tank in Finding Nemo. Hey, oh, good, 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 good. Um, <laughs> is it a clownfish? Is it a blue tang? Is it, yeah, I'm sure uh, Pliny the Elder the was familiar with those <laughs> tropical fishes. Yeah, those Great Barrier Reef yeah. fish. Do you, do you know the Latin? <laughs> word or a latin word for delay is it okay if the answer is no it is okay if the answer is no but it is also an anagram of the word roma latin for rome oh my gosh okay i mean that's that's helpful because there's only so many ways you can de anagrammatize roma yeah uh uh is and then it, that becomes uh, a um, fish um, <laughs> um, more, uh, more is it like a uh, oh, one of those more, m- m- mola isn't that a fish? Well, that's a big fish, not a little fish. Actually, that's great. There is a mola mola. Yeah, that's the big, the big giant that's one. Right. That's right. That's right. But a mora is that one? Mora is the Latin word for delay. M O R A. Now, if you take that okay. word, oh, I know what it is, and add a little bit to it, you get this fish. Is it a mora eel? That is a great guess, but that's not it. Oh, that was man. my thought too. Then I think we're through, Mike. <laughs> okay. Well, the it's a tough one, bec- not because you can't do the etymological thinking, but because it, not everybody knows the name of this animal. But it's a remora. Remora. A remora. I know that because of Pokemon. Dumb, dumb. <laughs> the remora fish has a modified dorsal fin, which is the fin on its back, 
that is essentially like a suction cup. It is the fish that attaches itself to whales, sharks, dolphins, and other animals like that. Right. And feeds off the debris and bacteria that uh, live on and around that animal. The remora is called a remora because it creates hydrodynamical drag on the hosts that it attaches itself to. And it was believed that this fish could attach itself to a ship on the hull or some number of such fish could do so and stop the ship from moving as quickly or with as much agility as it ought to. And so it's remora, remora. Oh. Pliny had a lot to say about the remora. And if you will indulge a bit more Pliny rhetoric, I'll give you more detail <laughs> on his views on the remora. I Tell us more about Pliny, the elder, right? <laughs> that's the one. Yeah, he said, one. winds may blow and storms may rage. And yet the Echinis, which is the remora, controls their fury, restrains their mighty force and bids ship stand still in their career, a result which no cables, no anchors from their ponderousness quite incapable of being weighed could ever have produced. A fish bridles the impetuous violence of the deep and subdues the frantic rage of the universe. And all of this by no effort of its own, no act of resistance on its part, no act at all, in fact, but that of adhering to the bark. Trifling as this object would appear, it suffices to counteract all these forces combined and to forbid the ship to pass onward in its way. Wow. Beautiful. I feel like you could use that as my eulogy. <laughs> <laughs> Pliny was a colorful, a colorful writer. Yeah, clearly. Yes. He, he certainly was. All right, Mike, let's get another aminal. All right. So next one. <laughs> Um, another one, another one from the old uh, Pliny bookshelf here. Oh, oh wow, he's got a whole list of them. That's great. Pliny <laughs> menagerie. Yeah, he was <laughs> maybe maybe one of the first uh, totem studiers out there. This mystery animal's scientific name comes from ancient Persian and means lives in fire. This comes from the false belief that this mystery animal was born in fire or could walk through fire without being harmed. One of the earliest references to this myth was published in Pliny the Elder's Historia Naturalis from the first century AD. Pliny threw one of these animals into the fire to see if it could survive the flames. It did not. Nevertheless, <laughs> Pliny, <laughs> Pliny claimed that the animal still had special powers. I'll leave it there. And if you want to hear more from Pliny about some of the details of this animal, I'll provide it to you. Well, about halfway through that, <laughs> Kyle mouthed the words, I know this. So I'm very curious I mean, to see him live up to that claim. I don't know if I know it, but I've got a guess. All right. Uh, is it a salamander? It is a salamander. Yes. Wow. Very good. <laughs> good job, Kyle. You know what helped me with that? Pokemon what? again. <laughs> Thank you, Pokemon. The fire salamander, salamandra, salamandra. Love and it. and the, the origin of the fire myth is not entirely clear. Of course, they don't live in fire. But one hypothesis <laughs> is that these animals, these little amphibians, would sleep or hibernate in logs during cold weather. And people would bring these logs into their house, throw them on a fire long, long ago. And the animal would wake up and crawl out of it. Scurry out. And people would think, oh, this wow. thing was just born in fire and lives in fire. What a horrifying thing if you're making like your family fire to cook dinner and then <laughs> And out scurries a little <laughs> lizard. He's like, ah. <laughs> I love that visual. <laughs> yeah. Science was a little different back then. Yeah. Just you know? a, little. a little different. We're learning. <laughs> it would hold up. A little different here meaning bat. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 You know, Leonardo threw a log on his fire and this thing came out. So if you just have a fire, you might just have lizards in your house. I mean, write it down, Pliny. <laughs> What gets me is that Pliny threw the animal on the fire and it died. And then he still yeah. said that, well, you know, that one wasn't a very, that one was a dud. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, dud. <laughs> it was just a bad salamander. Must have been an outlier. Yeah. <laughs> Love it. Okay. I have, uh, you guys are doing great. Really. I'm very impressed. And I've got Thank one you. more for you. So we're already basically at the hardest level. So it, all right. Amazing. Hardest level. Uh, this mystery animal's scientific name comes from the Latin words meaning little bird and pertaining to. The name refers to a 1705 illustration of this animal, which was one of the first depictions of this animal to capture the public's imagination and impact how the public saw this animal. I mean, 
right away my thought is a parrot but not because of any like real scientific reason just i was remembering pop and jay <laughs> when you when we learned about parrots <laughs> i feel like we talked about pertaining to and what the latin like root for that is and i'm trying to get it but i feel like that's not going to help me all that much so i'm going to stop <laughs> thinking of that should we request another clue Kyle? i think we shall and sh- should reverse and that. do and do <laughs> request <laughs> yes are you are you officially requesting clue number one officially i'm yes. pressing the button on my game show panel here. <laughs> yeah. i would like a clue <laughs> and here's your clue Maria Sibylia Marion, a German naturalist and scientific illustrator, drew the illustration that led to this animal's scientific name. The illustration is based on a real event that Marion witnessed in Suriname. It is unclear whether the bird depicted in the illustration was caught live by the mystery animal or whether the mystery animal was scavenging a dead bird. So is this animal a bird or is it a different animal that hunts birds? This animal is not a bird. This is an animal that was witnessed and illustrated with a bird, but it was unclear whether what Marion saw was this animal catching a live bird or scavenging an already dead bird. Remember, this is an illustration that captured the public's imagination you know, it was really a big deal at the time. And you have an animal something doing something untoward with a bird. <gasps> oh. Well, oh, I'm I mean, sorry. When you I said untoward, wanna... I thought of other things. <laughs> it's not something that I would want it to be doing to me, but that could be a lot of sure. things, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay. So we just came off sex lies and insults. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So I'm picturing, I mean, immediately I went for like a wild cat of some sort, but I feel like birds are like ooh, small pickings for a wild cat. I feel like they would go for bigger things. Well, it so could be a, a little like thing? a, like a, like a bobcat or an ocelot. Oh yeah. Should we request another a clue if there is one i think we should i just want to say if it's a bobcat does that mean that bob means pertaining to birds and that's <laughs> um no let's let's get a clue let's get a all clue. right i'm i'm pressing the button again here's your final clue and this is one will really test the etymological you know strength here before Uh-oh. this species was given its current tautonomous name it belonged to another genus and that genus name was aranea a r a N-E-A. The name Aranea is a new Latin word derived from similar sounding French, Spanish, and Italian words for this type of animal. Um, I mean, immediately you said Aranea and I was thinking like arachnid, but now I'm trying to imagine how a spider might be caught eating a bird feasting on a bird. But no, there are bird catching (laughs) spiders. Is it like a big one? Is it a big spider? It is the pink toe tarantula. (gasps) Oh, <gasps> wow. Wow. A large, well, Kyle, you get credit for that. Excellent Pink job. Toad. The scientific name is Avicularia avicularia. Avicula meaning little bird and the ia essentially meaning pertaining to. And the illustration by Marion uh, shows a tarantula eating a bird about its size or larger. And it was a fascinating image for people in 1705. It blew up all over the Twitter and Instagram equivalent of the day. And uh, it is the namesake <laughs> for this animal. Oh, Seth just sent us the picture. Oh, oh, look at it. It's just, wow. It is just, yeah, feasting on that bird, huh? Its toes are yellow here, though. So I just want to say that <laughs> the lady who drew this really needs to get her colors right. <laughs> <laughs> It couldn't be the 300 years of pigment changing from the Yeah, no, 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 no. <laughs> It no, was her eyes. Sure her fault. Uh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Love that. Thank uh, you, Mike. This is fantastic. Yes. That was a fantastic game. Seth wants to make sure that everyone knows that I lost to that game. <laughs> <laughs> and I won. So thank you. <laughs> well done to both of you. I was very impressed, really. It was a thank good you, game. Mike. That was yeah, a it was lot really of fun, good. Mike. It was a lot of fun. I noticed that all of those autonomous species were animals and not plants. Is that a coincidence or a fact? It's a great question, and it is not a coincidence. As much as we love totonyms in zoological nomenclature, totonyms are expressly forbidden in the world of botany. 
including oh, names. Forbidden. That's right. For plants, animals, and fungi, they have their own separate nomenclatural code. And there's a rule that says you can't name anything a Todd name. So and it's sort of interesting because the zoological code and the botanical code serve a similar, if not identical purpose in their respective fields. And it's odd for them to have a different rule here, given that they're so similar in many, many other ways. Yeah, oh, and and you have taken a personal interest in this dichotomy. Y- yes, I've never fully understood why botanists had it out for autonomous. They are, <laughs> I think they're, you know, a source of public curiosity. I think they're an interesting way to learn and memorize animal names. I think it's a gateway to scientific names for children and lay people like myself. So it just sort of struck me as strange that in botany, they don't allow it. I spent some time researching the many different botanical nomenclatural codes over, I don't know, 150 years or or so, as well as the codes in zoology, bacteriology, and viruses to get a sense of what might have happened throughout history to sort of prohibit totonyms in botany. And I have a hypothesis that the current ban on totonyms in botany is a vestige of rules and customs that just no longer exist. The botanical nomenclatural code has evolved uh, over many years, and I think some of the rules that require a prohibition on totonyms no longer exist. To make a long story short, I've written up my findings and submitted it to what will be the 20th International Botanical Congress for their consideration. And who knows, maybe in Madrid next year when that Congress convenes, they will review my proposal and allow totonyms or tell me to pound sand. <laughs> <laughs> so you've been looking into, you know, the the plant nomenclature and stuff like that. Is there like a plant that you know of that you would say like, oh, this would make a great totonym? That's a great question. My knowledge of plants is really not as strong as it should be. But there are former totonyms in plants, plants that had tautonymous names before some of the earliest codes were developed that prohibited totonyms. So when that happened, the prohibition was retroactive and they had to rename those plants to make them no longer tautonymous. So I'd say some of the first candidates for tautonymous names, if we apply my rule retroactively, would be those. And there are others that have near tautonymous names. Uh, Zizifus, Zizifus is one where, you know, in one version of the word, it has an I and another version has a Y. So those would be some that we might bring into the Tottenham's family. Kyle, I actually have an answer for that question. Oh, okay. (laughs) I have. So fun fact about the ginkgo tree is that it has no living genetic relatives all the way up to its order. It is the only species in its order. So I feel like that one would be a very good candidate. To be like oh. ginkgo, ginkgo. That's also that's, my that's just a little phrase. fun fact. I had. That's my catchphrase too. <laughs> ginkgo, ginkgo. Is that a, is that another Pokemon? The ginkgo? Yeah, I think so. <laughs> yeah, ginkgo. yeah. That's a great that's a great point, Emily. And what you find in zoology sometimes, not always, but sometimes, is the tautonomously named species will be what they call the type species of that genus or the common base kind of that genus. So in the case right. of the ginkgo, it would make a lot of sense. Yeah, I think if so. If I go to Madrid like for this uh, conference, I will, you know, raise that and make sure you get full credit. Yeah, please, please uh, <laughs> bring my concerns along. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so you're taking this interest now to the next level with a book, which you were telling us about, which is so exciting. How has that been going? It's been going great. I started this research into totonyms about two and a half years ago. And maybe a year ago, I reached a tipping point with it where I thought, you know, I just need to memorialize this somewhere for future generations. Maybe, you know, 300 mm-hmm. years from now, somebody will want to know all the totonyms and how they got their names. Uh, Or maybe nobody will, but I put in enough work that I feel like it should go somewhere. So I've uh, spent some time drafting the book. I have it in nearly final form. I'm expecting to publish it and release it in late spring or early summer this year. I have a very good friend of mine who's illustrated or provided a number of illustrations. There are no snake eating or bird eating spiders in this one, but there's still time. So we (laughs) can- Probably for the best. (laughs) There's still time. Yeah. (laughs) We can add that. In parallel, I'm also working on a children's book of totonyms that will hopefully help introduce the concept of scientific names 
to children through the use of totems and their etymologies. That's wow. so exciting. C- congratulations well, for you. That's really, that's wonderful. Thank you. Yeah. I mean, both of those books sound like a very fun time for kids and adults. Please do keep us posted on the eventual publication. And maybe, you know, once you do your like international book tour, yeah. we can tag along for a, for a stop. <laughs> yeah, I'd love, I'd don't, love to. Don't stop in Suriname. <laughs> 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 yeah, I'd love to. I mean, it's so rare that I get to just talk, you know, almost endlessly about tautonyms to people in real life. So if, uh, you know, <laughs> you want to have me talk more about it, I'd love to come back. Anytime. Yeah, anytime. But for now, speaking of all the fun of tautonyms, Mike, you treated us to that very lovely quiz earlier. How do you feel about playing a game yourself? And Kyle, this is only a question for Mike. You yeah. have no choice. I would love to. I feel like I put you guys through a tough quiz, so it's only just to bring it back <laughs> upon me. <laughs> Let's get into tautonym a little bit. Etymologically speaking, tautonym comes from the Greek tautos, which means the same, and nim or onim or onuma, meaning name. There exists, however, a field in both language and logic called tautology. We're going to talk about the language one, because I'll be honest, the logical one, boy, there's a lot going on in, (laughs) in logical tautology, and I don't even get it. But linguistic tautology is, I have a quote here, the saying of the same thing twice in different words, generally considered to be of a fault of style, a mistake. So to break away from the words of animals here and give you both equal footing, here's a game I'd like to call, you can say that again, again. You can say that again, again. Why are you this time? It's different. In the world of tautologies, there is something called RAS syndrome. And now you might be asking yourselves, what is, what does RAS stand for? Radical Antarctic smelling. That's my guess. a rhetorical question. Ah, darn it. (laughs) (laughs) RAS stands for redundant acronym syndrome. So RAS syndrome is redundant acronym syndrome syndrome. (laughs) Uh, And you might be familiar with these in your everyday life, like when you go to the ATM machine, a.k.a the automated teller machine machine. So what I'm going to do is give you descriptions or clues to a common victim of RAS syndrome. And the first one to guess what it is gets the point. So for example, if, if, if I asked you, where might you withdraw or deposit cash with no human interaction, you might say the ATM, the ATM machine. machine. The ATM machine. You got machine, it. Machine, machine. Yeah. Machine. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Perfect. Yes. You grok? I think we grok. I grok. So, first question. Okay. These are going to be these are going to be quick and easy. You'll get these. Mm-hmm. First question, this is what you may input at the ATM machine to gain access to your account. I see a buzz in from Mike. Would it be the personal identification number number? It is. Oh, really it's good. your PIN number. <laughs> oh, yep. wow. I never ever stopped to think about what PIN stood for. <laughs> yeah. It is it is a tautology because it is Personal identification number number. Love that. All right. Question two. This is technology used in cars and on phones to help people navigate. I mean, is it a GPS system? Yes. Okay. Which would be, what would the tautology be there? Global positioning system system. Yeah, you got it. I was going to, I was going to say a global GPS, but um, I don't think people say that. I don't think that's a term that people use. Well, we could. We could say global GPS system, and then it's like a <laughs> like a double tautology. It's a a tautology. A tautology. <laughs> <laughs> All right, this one is is a little trickier because I don't know if the acronyms is well known. This is a major brand which has given us the likes of Superman, Batman, and Wonder Woman. Oh, it, is it DC? Co- do, we can say it at the same time. Yeah, is it DC? One, yeah, ready? Two, Three, two, one. DC Comics. <laughs> DC Comics. <laughs> Clean. Detective Beautiful. Comics Comics, I think. Oh, hey, you got it. I wouldn't very have known. Good. Yeah. That point goes to Mike for knowing what DC stood for, which I didn't until today. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So, so far it's Mike 2, Kyle 1. Next question. This is technology we use in the screens of calculators or old digital watches or modern TVs. Is it a liquid crystal display display? Yes, Mike, it oh. is. Oh. Wow. I feel 
good amazing <laughs> you're I'm you're just, doing great yeah, i also I mean, seriously yeah i did not know what lcd stood for today yeah. either i mean if i had heard that if you had like said that a lot of people like oh yeah lcd but i would not have <laughs> uh, yeah i was going to say lsd but that didn't seem right um <laughs> but i think i had a, a lawsuit involving lcd something or other and that's maybe where it seeped into my brain oh Ooh. All right, last one. This is a little bit tricky, but this might be what a polite person places at the bottom of their wedding invitation. This is a toughie. I mean, I've got a guess. Does it okay. does it cross language barriers the the answer? It, d- yeah. it does cross is it language like, barriers. Please RSVP. Kyle, you got yeah. it. <laughs> so what is what is the tautology there? Do you well, know? yes. RSVP stands for rendezvous, s'il vous plaît. Close. It's oh, répondé, s'il vous plaît. Okay. Respond. I'm going to say that again. We're going to edit it. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> uh, I got yes, the s'il vous so plaît part, though. That's the please. You did. That's the SVP in, in uh, RSVP. So please RSVP would be please respond, please. <laughs> please respond, please. I'm desperate. Yeah. We've got we've so, so much money into this wedding. Just let us know if you're coming. <laughs> I was thinking the answer was glitter. People put that in in wedding oh. invitations, don't they? But that's not not, not polite people, though. Very <laughs> impolite people put glitter in their invitations. <laughs> uh, well, Kyle, it was a good answer, but unfortunately, Mike reigns supreme, the king king yeah, of, all so. tautos. of all tatos. Of all tatos. Thank you very much. Congratulations, Thank you. Mike. Yeah. All right. Yeah. What is what is your decree as king of tatos? <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Mm-hmm. Bye bye. <laughs> <laughs> really good. Short really and sweet. Good. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, listen, Mike, thank you so much for joining us today on Butter No Parsnips. Mike, the people, as we've stated, should all go follow you on at Tautonyms on Instagram. Is there anything else they should keep an eye out for? Anything else you want to plug? Yeah, it's, it'll all be there on the Instagram page. I'll announce the book. When that comes out there, I'll have a little shop set up there. If I ever start a TikTok or any other social media, you'll hear about it there first. So come on down to the Tautonyms Instagram page. We have a lot of fun. And... Um, I'll see you there. Fantastic. We will all see you there, and we'll definitely be keeping an eye out for your book for sure, Mike. Both of them, when they come out. Yes. And as for us, everybody remember, you can find Butter No Parsnips on social media, on Facebook, and on Instagram, at Butter No Parsnips Podcast. If you like today's episode, you can consider giving us a five-star rating or review wherever you heard us. Your feedback really helps us to know if we're doing a good job. And if you're a fan of the job that we are doing and want even more of it, consider donating to our Patreon at patreon.com slash Butter No Parsnips. Donating $5 or more a month grants you access to our afterthought blurbs, which are a new thing we're doing, where we give you a little more context about the words that we cover here. Uh, Thank you so much to our Patreon supporters. And with that, I've been Kyle Imperator. I've been Emily Moyers. And you've been Mike Steffen. Thank you again so much, Mike, for joining us. And thank you all out there for listening. Butter No Parsnips will be back next week. Hey. Hey. Thank you for listening to Butter No Parsnips. Butter No Parsnips is produced by Seth Glicksman, Emily Moyers, and Kyle Imperator. The theme music and additional music is by Kyle Imperator. If you liked listening to this episode, subscribe and give us a good rating and or positive review wherever you heard it. If you really liked listening, consider donating to our Patreon at patreon.com slash butternoparsnips. There you can get bonus content you can't get anywhere else, like the monthly Patreon-exclusive podcast Buttered Parsnips. Your support means the world to us and encourages us to keep making more. Thanks in advance, and we'll be back next week.